President Biden gets a Supreme Court pick. The person I will nominate will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. Justice Stephen Breyer announces his retirement, and President Biden vows his replacement will make history. I'm going to give the president's nominee, whoever that may be, a fair look. Setting the stage for a Senate debate ahead of the midterms. Plus, we're acting with equal focus and force to bolster Ukraine's defenses and prepare a swift, united response to further Russian aggression. Tensions over Russia and Ukraine intensify. Next. This is Washington Week. Corporate funding is provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by the estate of Arnold Adams. Ku and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson. Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves. Robert and Susan Rosenbaum. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, moderator Yamish Alcindor. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. President Biden was busy this week with two major issues, the Supreme Court and the possible invasion by Russia of Ukraine. Now, on Thursday, the first for the first issue, Justice Stephen Breyer, announced the end of the, that, uh, that he would retire at the end of his, the Supreme Court term. Now, with Breyer leaving, the ideological balance of the court will not change. But this does give President Biden a chance to make history and energize the Democratic base. As a candidate, President Biden pledged to nominate a black woman to the bench. The promise came at the strong urging of a key political ally of the president, South Carolina Democrat Jim Clyburn. One of the real undercurrent floating throughout uh, the black community was the fact that no black woman had ever been seriously considered for the United States Supreme Court. On Thursday, President Biden stood by his word. The person I will nominate will be someone with extraordinary qualifications, character, experience, and integrity. And that person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. Joining me now to discuss what comes next, Nancy, Nancy Cortez, Chief White House Correspondent for CBS News, Aisha Rasko, White House Correspondent for NPR, and Ariane DeVogue, Supreme Court Reporter for CNN. Thank you all of, here for, all of you for being here. Ariane, of course, you're at the Supreme Court. I have to start with you. Talk about what went into Justice Breyer deciding to retire at this moment. And also talk a little bit about his legacy and what he leaves behind as he, as he now is preparing to retire. Right. Justice Breyer is an optimist. He's a pragmatist. He's also a steadfast liberal. Um, if you look at his legacy, you've got to look at his cases, what he cared about. He cared a lot in recent years about the death penalty. He thought that that should be revisited. He thought it was being applied arbitrarily. He wanted the court to take a look at the constitutionality again. That'll be left on the table because liberals didn't join him on that effort. He also wrote big opinions on abortion, over the years. And this term, he was really unhappy when the Supreme Court let that Texas law that bans abortion before most women even know they're pregnant uh, to go into effect. Uh, he was always a big supporter of the Affordable Care Act. And one of the cases that I remembered uh, the most, because he read a dissent from the bench, it was when the court blocked an effort by some school districts to uh, desegregate. And he said, he said that that was a betrayal of Brown v. Board of Education. Now, of course, there were some liberals who were pressuring him to step down. Uh, they saw what happened to Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, when she died and her seat went to a conservative. And some really wanted him to step down last term. But he had decided to stay, and that's probably because he thought that he might be able to contribute to the conversation uh, this term. But boy, when you saw what the court did with that Texas case, when they blocked um, President Biden's attempt uh, to get more people vaccinated, he was really firmly in dissent. 
Uh, but most of all, his legacy, and he talked about this a lot this uh, last year. In fact, he always brought this up in speeches, is he cared a lot about the institution of the court. He would say over and over again that the justices aren't junior varsity politicians, that they're divided by their ideological philo uh, philosophies. Uh, he saw that while a lot of progressives have been saying that they wanted to change the court, maybe change the composition, he wanted the court to stay the same. Uh, he cared about its institutional independence. And more than anything else, he cared about civility. His colleagues really yeah. like him. And that's, uh, those, are, those are the big parts of his legacy. A big legacy that he will be leaving behind. I want to talk to you about who are the leading contenders to replace him and talk specifically about the specific judge that Jim Clyburn is pushing for. Right. Well, you, as you said, this isn't going to change the balance of the court. It's going to be 6-3, but uh, there is going to be a younger, maybe a more liberal um, uh, candidate who takes uh, his place. Uh, on the top of, before we get to Clyburn's pick, on the top of the list uh, is, of course, Katenji Brown-Jackson. Uh, she is 51 years old, and she's important for a lot of reasons. One, she's a former Briar clerk. She has this glittering resume but she was just confirmed for a lower port, uh, court position. That's important, especially if they're going to want to go quickly here. Another one on the list, Leander Kruger. She sits on the California Supreme Court. She worked in the Obama administration during the in the DOJ. And you talk to anybody there, and they think she's brilliant. She could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any conservative. Now to Representative Clyburn. That's a different kind of um, uh, name being put forward because it happens every time. The president has these allies. They want him to consider their uh, choices. And that's Michelle Childs. She's a South Carolina judge. She's actually right now up for appeals court seat. She'll be interesting to watch. And then two more people on the list. I don't think either one of these would actually make it uh, uh, to a confirmation, but they're there for an important reason, and that's Sherilyn Eiffel, as well as uh, Anita Earls. These two women are giants in the area of um, civil rights. Uh, President Biden cares a lot about that. He's changed the type of nominees he's put on the lower courts, and he wants these to be high on the list as well. And Nancy, I want to come to you. You've covered, and I have to get this right, the last four Supreme Court justices, the last four nominations. Talk a little bit about what the timeline might look like here. And even though Democrats have that 50-50 split with the vice president being able to, to vote and, and break the tie there, what could Republicans do to possibly try to slow this down? Well, there are a lot of things that they can do to slow it down in a 50-50 Senate. Um, and, and actually, Yamish, there are a lot of things that could happen to slow things down, even if Republicans don't do anything. I mean, that's the problem when you've got an evenly split Senate like this. If just one Democratic senator is sick and can't vote, um, uh, you know, there are all kinds of things that could happen that would suddenly mean the Democrats don't have the votes they need if all Republicans decide to vote no. And that's why you have a lot of Democrats right now saying, let's move fast. On one hand, you know, Justice Breyer has already said he wants to stay till the end of this term. That's six months away. Uh, you might say, well, you know, they, they have time here to move slowly, uh, to go very deliberately. But Democrats are concerned that anything could happen. Um, you know, just recently, we got an example when one senator uh, got COVID, uh, tested positive, and a vote that they were hoping to have um, ended up having to be delayed. So there are Democrats who are urging the White House not to wait a month to name the president's pick. They'd like to see uh, a name uh, come up even sooner than that. And then they want to move quickly to go through the confirmation process, have uh, this jurist come and meet with senators on Capitol Hill, hold confirmation hearings. And right now they believe that they could even hold a final vote to confirm this nominee even before Justice Breyer steps down at the end of the term. They say uh, that they've looked at other cases of uh, where this has happened in lower courts, where someone could get confirmed, say, in, in February, March, April, May, and then be seated once Breyer retires in June. Well, that could be quick. And as you said, even someone being seated before Breyer um, retires at the end of the Supreme Court term, obviously Democrats are motivated to do that. I want to talk about, though, of course, this pledge that the president made. In the history of the Supreme Court, 115 justices have served on the bench, but only seven of them were women of color. After the news broke, 
um, and after should say after they were people of color or women. Um, after the news broke, President Biden said he would keep his promise to nominate a black woman, a number of black women. Um, in response to that, they talked about the, what the significance of that would mean to them. Having a black woman represent the judiciary branch in the in the Supreme Court would be. Um, a fortification of my faith in democracy's capacity to heal itself, even after all of these radical ruptures that we've been witnessing. It is hard to overstate just how important and powerful and inspiring a moment this is. Aisha, I want to come to you. What are you hearing from civil rights leaders, but also from the White House, from Black women, about what this moment means to them? Oh, well, the historic nature of it is not lost on them. And I think that's why it was so important, especially now um, when Biden has had a lot of issues, as, as we know and as has often been talked about, um, with people feeling like he has not lived up to all of his promises, especially particularly to the Black community when it comes to voting rights, when it comes to policing and other things of that nature, this gives uh, President Biden a chance to actually deliver and to say that I have that this is a historic moment. You will have a, a black woman on the Supreme Court. Uh, the vice president will likely preside over and be the tie-breaking vote. Uh, she is a black woman of black and Asian descent, um, and so this will be historic. Um, this is something that will go down in the history books. And look, there has been some criticism from some people who have talked about, well, oh, will this be an asterisk by this person's name because he has stated so clearly that this will be a Black woman. But, you know, I have to remind everyone, look, for many, many years, every person on the on the Supreme Court was a white male. Uh, was that affirmative action? Like there were years where you could not be anything but a white male and get on the Supreme Court. Um, and, and, and so that context has to be there. And in all these years to just now be getting a black woman, um, you know, in some ways it is absolutely historic and amazing, but it's there's some sadness there. And I need to, the context that you bring, I think, is so important. Briefly, I want to just also talk about the fact that Biden administration officials, they also talk about that he's already nominated a bunch of people to the federal judges and that they've been very diverse. What are you hearing? Yeah, I mean, that is one of the arguments that they make when people bring up the fact, you know, that voting rights hasn't gotten done and these other things haven't gotten done. They point out the fact that they have uh, appointed an historic number of people of color to the federal bench um, and that, that this is one of the ways that they are delivering on their promises for equity um, and for getting diversity. And these are very important uh, appointments, as we see over and over again. These are uh, lifetime appointments um, that have a huge impact on the policies that are carried out by the government because of the decisions that courts make. And Ariane, Aisha's just talking about the huge impact that these um, nominees make, that these justices make. Talk a bit about sort of the issues that are at hand for the Supreme Court. Um, you, you talked so much, so eloquently and so smartly about sort of Justice Breyer's um, background, but talk a bit about the, the modern day court and the future of the court, what they'll have in front of them. Right. That's why I think this whole issue of timing is so interesting, because usually the process is two to three months. That all changed with Justice Amy Coney Barrett. The uh, Republicans pushed that through in um, just over 30 days, I think it was. So now, as uh, Nancy said, the uh, Democrats want to move quickly, but they don't want to move too quickly because they don't want to miss this moment. And the reason that is, is because a, this is so historic, the first African-American woman on the court that's going to reverberate, obviously, with young lawyers, young uh, children. And keep in mind, you could... Uh, Justice Kagan, Justice Sotomayor often talk about how it was to see Sandra Day O'Connor uh, on the bench and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That means a lot. But this is a moment for another reason, too. And that's because the Supreme Court right now, as we said, they're discussing whether or not to overturn Roe v. Wade. They're discussing behind closed doors whether to expand gun rights. Next year, it's affirmative action. All that is going to be playing out this spring at the same time that we have these confirmation hearings. And that means the Democrats are going to be engage, be able to engage people that they don't may not usually be paying attention. They're going to see what happens at the Supreme Court, and these hearings yeah. are going to be going on at the same time. 
Well, thank you so much, Ariane, for joining um, the show tonight and sharing your reporting. I want to now move on to the other, of course, big issue of the week, and it is the escalating tensions between Russia and Ukraine. On Monday, the Pentagon announced that 8,500 American troops have been placed on high alert for possible deployment to Eastern Europe. And just tonight, President Biden said he would be moving troops to the area in, quote, the near term. Um, the Pentagon also confirmed for the first time publicly that Russia has enough troops on the border to invade the entire country of Ukraine. I want to also talk about the fact that the president um, is continuing to warn Russia that there will be dire consequences if they invade Ukraine. I made it clear to uh, early on to uh, President Putin that if he were to move into Ukraine that there would be severe consequences, including significant economic sanctions, as well as I feel obliged to beef up our presence, NATO's presence in on the Eastern Front. But Republican Senator Lindsey Graham called for immediate action. What we're doing is not working. Uh, the bottom line, Putin deserves to be sanctioned now. We're talking way too much. We're doing way too little. But in an interview with Nancy, Nancy Cortez, that is here with us, a Democratic Senator Chris Coons, a close ally of the president, of the president, he also called for immediate action. We need to come together in a bipartisan way and pass a robust package of sanctions. That may include some sanctions uh, that would be imposed now. Now, joining us again, as she did last Friday, is Vivian Salama. She's a national security reporter for The Wall Street Journal. She is joining us from Ukraine up early on her side of the world. Vivian, thanks so much for being here. Tell us what's the latest that you're hearing about what the possible threat is of some sort of imminent danger. Is there imminent danger? What are you hearing from your sources and national security officials? Well, Yamisha, it depends who you ask. Uh, the U.S. has been hammering the fact that um, the danger is imminent, that uh, President Putin is moving closer to an invasion. The Pentagon talked even about sort of the moving around of assets um, to indicate that this was more than just a, a you know, a, a ploy or some sort of a, a bluff, uh, which a lot of folks um, in Europe and here in Ukraine are suggesting. Um, they're talking about uh, moving medical units to the border and other things to suggest that um, that they are going to move uh, fairly soon. And so there was a phone call this week between President Biden and Ukrainian President Zelensky, where President Biden warned him of the fact that uh, this this really is a growing threat. But President Zelensky, who we just saw uh, sat down with um, a little while ago for a, a small press conference with foreign press, insisted that he knows his country better than anyone else. And while he does believe that the threat is there, he does not think that it's anything new from what they've been experiencing with Russia since the last time uh, Russia invaded Ukraine about eight years ago. And so they continue to downplay the threat. But not only that, they also are urging allies, especially the U.S., to stop going out there publicly and sort of put, placing this fear in people of an imminent attack, because he said repeatedly in this press conference, it's going to have a negative impact on our economy here in Ukraine. People are going to start to rush the banks. They're going to flee the country. And they don't want to see that. And so the Ukrainian government urging NATO allies to say, yes, we need to work together. We need your help. But we also need you to keep calm and tone it down. And, and I want to go to Nancy. Nancy, you're hearing sort of Vivian talk about sort of the discrepancy between the President Zelensky and President Biden. But I also want to I'm interested in the fact that President Biden, his thinking seems to have evolved a bit on this issue as, of course, the, the dynamics have changed. What have, what's your reporting revealed here? Well, I think that the message that he and other U.S. officials are trying to send uh, is, is aimed at a different audience than Zelensky. So the president and U.S. officials, first of all, are trying to sound the alarm around the world about the possibility of Russian aggression. And they're trying to keep NATO together, keep their NATO allies on their side, on the side of strong punishments for Putin if he does invade. Zelensky, on the other hand, as Vivian pointed out, uh, he's trying to keep his population calm. And he's trying to show his population that he's in charge. And so naturally, U.S. officials tell us his language is going to be very different. He's going to argue that, um, that an attack isn't imminent, that he's got everything under control. 
whereas U.S. officials say they strongly disagree. They're very concerned that Putin could invade any day now. He's got even more troops uh, surrounding Ukraine than he did a few weeks ago. They are now stationed uh, on the border with Belarus, in addition to the border with Russia. And they're very concerned, and, and they're not going to heed Zelensky's pleas to, to back off of that argument. They continue to say that they believe an attack could happen at any time. And Vivian, of course, Nancy was just talking about sort of Russian troops, but there are, of course, also American troops now on high alert. What's your understanding of what it would take for those American troops to be deployed and for this to be a sort of military issue? It's hard to say, Yamish, because the president, President Biden, has repeatedly said that he does not want to see boots on the ground in Ukraine. And that is largely the consensus among most NATO allies, where they do believe that they have to reinforce European security, but whether or not they would rush to the aid of Ukraine in the event of uh, uh, an invasion by Russia in the form of military action remains to be seen. And these troops, by the way, are part of the posturing that we've been seeing over the last few years with regard to Russia's complaints about NATO and NATO's complaints about Russia, where uh, it's essentially what comes first, the chicken or the egg. You know, the Russians blame NATO for carrying out exercises and moving troops into Europe and say that that's a direct provocation against Russia. And NATO says vice versa, that the Russians continue their aggression. And so this is just ramping things up with the escalation that we've now seen along half of the Ukrainian border. Um, now NATO allies are saying that we, they, they are going to have to ramp things up as well. And so what they're saying is they're putting these troops on readiness, sort of a, a, you know, uh, any kind of state of state of emergency situation where if they need to move quickly, they will. Whether they do or not remains to be seen, Yamish, though. And it really does not, um, it does not seem likely um, that anything short of an invasion of Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, yeah. which most folks here believe is pretty far-fetched, but with, as Nancy just mentioned, there's soldiers in Belarus about 120 kilometers from Kiev. That threat sort of went up a little bit. And so that the, yeah. you know, the readiness of troops, um, you know, is really important just in case. And Aisha, um, what are the politics at play when you talk to White House officials? And in particular, what are what's going through President Biden's mind and he, as he is thinking about sort of not giving into pressure or the pressure that he's facing for sanctions to try to sanction Russia? How does he sanction Russia without also provoking President Putin? Yeah, I think that's a part of the issue. And I, I actually asked uh, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki about this very issue um, this week. I asked about these calls that they do sanctions now and not wait. She pointed out there have that there have been some individuals uh, in Russia that have been sanctioned. But what she said was uh, that the uh, the threat of these massive sanctions, including some like export controls where they would try to block certain exports, uh, you know, technology exports to Russia, that that these that the threat of the sanctions they view as the major deterrent. Um, and so they feel like that at this point, that is enough. Um, at, part of the issue is that if you do get into sanctions, you do get into this tit for tat um, because, I mean, experts say that Russia will respond they're not just going to take take major sanctions on the chin and not do anything about it. Um, they will respond. Um, and so there is a, a concern about a spiraling effect that they want to avoid. It, it is interesting that the White House is still saying, and uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said today, uh, that conflict is not inevitable. They're still trying to lean into diplomacy. Um, you have the German Chancellor coming to the White House next week. I'm sure this will be a major topic of discussion, and they're trying to find Find a way out of this. Trying to find a way out of this. Uh, Vivian, when, when you think about sort of what Aisha's just talking about there, President Biden said if Russia invaded Ukraine, it would change the world. You also, of course, are coming back here. I know you're heading back to the stateside soon. Um, talk a little bit about how this might change the world, but also insert a little bit of the politics here. We have about 45 seconds left, but really, if you can, talk about the politics, both domestically, but also the politics globally. 
Well, you mean a ground war in Europe in 2022 is pretty unprecedented, and that's what everybody is afraid of, that we could be entering a new phase. Um, and wars now are not just conventional. They're not just boots. They're hybrid. They're cyber. There are a number of other things with technologies. And so that's the main concern. But for President Biden, the political implications are much larger. If President Putin succeeds and is able to invade Ukraine, the fear is that it opens the door to other actors, uh, malign actors, to continue their own uh, campaigns, namely China in Taiwan, but also many others. And yeah. so a lot, of, uh, a lot of pressure on President Biden to be able to put a stop to this so that he can also send a message to the rest of the world that this kind of action will not be tolerated. That is what she said, a lot of pressure on President Biden. Um, thank you so much, Nancy, Aisha, Vivian. and I appreciate you coming on, sharing all of your reporting. I also, we of course will be continuing our conversation on the Washington Week Extra. Find it on our Facebook, YouTube, and, and, and on our website. Um, I also, on Monday, please watch the PBS News Hour. The show will be focusing on how climate change is changing the long tradition of outdoor ice skating. Thank you again for joining me. I'm Yami Shalsendor. Good night from Washington.